And tonight on Nightwaves, we'll be taking a look at life on less than a dollar a day and unearthing some surprising truths about poor economics in a new book. Robert Walser revived why a Swiss-German writer has a new translation and a new following. But first, South Africa's Nobel Prize-winning author and anti-apartheid campaigner Nadine Gordimer publishes her 15th novel, and it takes the lid off life in post-apartheid South Africa. No Time Like the Present follows the fortunes of a racially mixed family in a Johannesburg suburb. It's a story of life after the winds of change have swept across the country. Jabu and Steve are the main characters, struggling to come to terms with a society whose divisions persist and where private happiness is often undermined by concerns at corruption and political intolerance. Gordimer often weaves her own experience and her frustrations into her fiction, but she also offers descriptions of the everyday texture of life here in the suburb, where ex-comrades from the struggle, black, white, gay and straight, rub along and discuss allegations of corruption at the highest levels of government. These become part of Daily Chronicle when the circle of the suburb rounds. Peter McKeezy, bitterly despondent. Who believe it? This is what we fought for? Tell me. This is why we were burned and chucked in the Kamati River. Everybody understands his authority to say this. Steve feels for and with Peter McKeezy. The shamefulness of the human race. Not personal. Worse than that. Why do we expect to be different? Mexico after their revolutions. Russia after the revolution. The fat cats are always with us. Just have to get on with it. Ubuntu. We must expect it. We must be different. What are you saying, Ubuntu? You know what that is, do you? What is happening to it? Why it comes to mean that because those comrades were in the struggle, they could drive their Mercedes and buy palaces for their wives with bribe millions from foreign crooks? Sell us out. How can you take it like that? Jabu's whole body restless with courage. Nadine Gordimo reading from No Time Like the Present. When I spoke to Nadine earlier, I started by asking her about the character she describes, people who fought for freedom but live with the less elevating reality of the new South Africa. But didn't this, doesn't this apply to other wars, proper big wars, that have taken place, uh, not internal conflicts such as ours was? I'm sure if one thinks of one's grandparents or whatever after the 1418 war and after the, the next war, the Second World War, of course... It is quite a problem to see whether, indeed, all that you fought for is now has a chance of being realised, whether it's going to be betrayed through other forces, through personal ambition, through, uh, as we all find now, <clears throat> to certain extents in all countries, and in, in my own country, most unfortunate, the general corruption, that people indeed have become extremely corrupt. And this goes way down from the government itself, members of the government, to the traffic cop who stops you when you're speeding, starts writing the ticket and then looks at you, and if you bring out your purse, you tear up the ticket. What's your relationship now to the ANC, which is the cause that's been at the heart of your life in many ways, but you seem to have quite strong disagreements with aspects of it? Well, now. I believe that the party, political party to which one belongs... It is not just a right, it is a duty to be critical, to take, indeed, the duty to be critical when you feel it is betraying itself. I am a supporter of the ANC, I'm still an ANC supporter and person, but um, I see that I cannot say that everything the ANC does must be regarded as absolutely right and proper. But, of course, all of us, whether completely involved in the actual practicalities and dangers of the struggle or in other ways being connected. We were completely devoted during those years to defeating apartheid, to getting rid of that regime. That was the force in our lives. We didn't have the time, we didn't have the mental and spiritual leisure either to think about what would happen afterwards when mm. we had achieved victory. This was a great mistake that we didn't do it, but in many cases, people, one couldn't do it. To sit and start saying, well, what will society like? Will people, will all racial um, prejudice go? And so we didn't. We, 
when the end of apartheid was going to be the end of all this. And indeed, in 1994, when we voted together for the first time, black, white, Indian, all shades, every colour, every kind, together. This was an experience, if you haven't had it, you can't imagine what it was like. And then, of course, we all parted, and we all know what happens after parties. There's the morning after. Now, we have, socially and politically speaking, we are living in the morning after, quite a long morning after. But I have to impress upon people in other countries, we have been free for only 18 years. It's not even a generation. Mm. And you expect us to have become complete have a completely democratic society that everybody is housed, that everybody has a job, whereas all the rest of you in the world, you still have tremendous inequalities and indeed unemployment problems. It is, as Bertolt Brecht called, the difficulties of the plains, isn't it, after the That's travails right. of the mountains? Yes. You've recently been speaking out against a new bill. This new Protection of State Information Bill, which is in other words, a form of censorship, and which threatens freedom of expression, which is guaranteed in something that people fought and died for, our wonderful constitution, one of the best in the world. In 1996, we accepted a very carefully thought out by our great minds of all colours and kinds, the constitution. And the constitution contains the Bill of Rights and Paramount in the Bill of Rights is indeed freedom of expression, that what we feel, what we doubt, what we want to assert, we can speak out about. But now we believe, those of us, the thousands of us who are indeed opposing this at home, that the real reason behind this bill that they want to bring in is indeed to conceal the corruption that is in high places. Because it would make inquiring into it, publishing material about oh, it. Impossible. Even the slightest mention of it is punishable. And for instance, if you are working in a government department, and I'm a journalist, and you tell me, well, you know, last week there was a heated discussion on so and so, this, that, and the other, and they disagreed, and I go back and write an article about it or an editorial in my paper, then I will be brought to court, and they will also ask me who was your informant. And you cannot say, as journalists have always been able to say, this is um, something I cannot reveal. You have to name the person. And having named you as my informant, you're going to be brought to book. And you too are liable from five years to 25 years imprisonment if the bill goes through. The answer for some people to these pincer movements of pressures is emigration, and it's a, a subject discussed in the book and also I think, widely discussed in the country itself and the tension between wanting to stay and be in this new country and be part mm -hmm. of it and just wanting to go somewhere else. Well, it's a matter of personal conscience and how you see your own life and the future of your children. It is, of course, in terms of figures, a very small proportion of, of people who indeed, as we call it, take the plane for Perth. It does remind me of the latter phase of the old East Germany, and it's very well evoked by a writer I think you also knew, the late Christa Wolf. Of course. You've written widely on other writers and edited a collection of writers, including Christa Wolf's work. Which writers do you find answer your own need in reading, conveying something universal but that also pertains to what you're living through? Oh, so many. Of course, Chinua Achebe is a truly great writer, not just for Africa, but he really is um, someone from whom one can get insights into the human condition anywhere. Uh, in this context, I might mention that it's interesting that at home now there is a blooming in writing for the theatre. Hmm. I've been a dis bit disappointed in the low volume and restricted subject matter of novels people who are writing it, beginning to write novels now. But the people who are writing and performing in the theatre, because usually the people who write the, the, the work are also the performers. So it's a wonderful unity of purpose and of um, uses of the, the imagination together. 
I just wondered how much, looking back over your work over many decades, I think you even started publishing before the Second World War, that uh, did you see yourself as... I started in 1939, the first story. I was 15. (laughs) Naturally, of course, it was uh, the most extraordinary, wonderful experience. Nothing I've ever published since has meant so much to me as seeing this story of mine in print. I don't remember what the story was, but there you are. You, no. just, you remember the feeling of publishing it. It's amazing that I don't remember. I'd have to go and look it up. <laughs> well, you did have a rather isolated childhood in which books seemed to be both an escape and a parallel world into which you could absorb yourself. But this is also what gave you the fundaments of being a great writer. Well, I don't know. I realized my education really was through, through books, through the fortunate thing that my mother read to me when I was a little child and... She made me a member of a children's library in the town where, a little t- mining town where I lived, and that was wonderful. And as she was a friend of the lady librarian, I was then allowed, like a little pig in clover, when I was 10, 11, I was reading the stories of D.H. Lawrence, you know, not Lady Chatterley, that wasn't in the library. But, so that but, could have but, been uh, a bit racy. <laughs> but and, that, I mean, that's the the side of your life that your mother encouraged, but you were also extremely isolated. And at times you weren't able to go to school, you weren't able to mix with other children. Oh, well, I went to school uh, until I was 11, and then she took me out on some pretext that I'm not prepared to go into. And then I had a few private lessons. But as I say, my I, I'm self-educated. I educated myself through reading. And when young people come to me and say, well, you know, how do you pre- become a writer? And they want to go to a creative writing school. I'm totally against creative writing schools. I think these things are good for journalists because you can learn how to be a journalist. There are certain precepts and rules. But the whole thing about being a poet or a novelist, you can't have any rules. You simply have to use your own perceptions, your own way of using the word. By reading, wide reading, you don't learn how to emulate or copy other writers, you learn the possibilities of the world and and you begin to see, what can I do with the word? When you look back now upon your upbringing, do you still feel frustrated or cross that you were cut off from some of your own peers and you weren't able to go on, have a university experience? You had to find your own way, a sort of parallel road. No, um, I get very bored with this with people who who depend upon the crummy childhood. Many of us have had the crummy childhood, and it just depends how you have uh, indeed moved on from there and seen that there's more to life and that you're just going to go out and become part of it. I've had, indeed, a very full life in many other ways. You've said Nelson Mandela is the person you most admire. When did you first meet him? I was very fortunate... I met him through an Englishman, through Anthony Sampson. He was going to the various trials. And when Nelson Mandela was in the treason trial, Anthony took me along with him. And as he was an accredited journalist, he was allowed to go down into the rooms where the waiting trial prisoners were. And uh, some pretense that I was his typist or his secretary or something, I went with him. And that's how I met Mandela first. And he, you managed to maintain this relationship in as much as one could, obviously, in the time that that he was in Robben Island. Did he want to see you when he got out of Robben Island? Yes, I was one of the first few people to have the great privilege of see, of talking to this wonderful man. But in a way, you know, prison walls did not a prison make because we all had the feeling that he was with us, that he was following everything that was happening in various phases of the struggle that he was now shut away from. He could smuggle out the odd note and letter and he could have smuggled in also various material. So in this way, not closely, not personally, but in in touch. And indeed, my novel, Burger's Daughter, was smuggled in and I have a great possession is a personal letter from him smuggled out after he'd read it. It's the best kind of review, isn't it? It was. I was talking there to Nadine Gordimer. Her novel, No Time Like the Present, is published by Bloomsbury. 